Good morning. Hi, I'm, I'm Bob Welch. I'm, I'm with the Corps of Engineers Laboratories in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, using simulations to develop advanced structural materials. A lot of people have asked me about, okay, you know, Corps of Engineers Laboratories and where are we, etc. So uh, this is our headquarters in Vicksburg, Mississippi. We have four laboratories there. We also have another laboratory in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, and also in the cold regions uh, in uh, Hanover, New Hampshire. Uh, uh, we've got about 2,500 uh, employees, about a thousand of these folks are engineers and scientists, about a quarter of them have PhDs, and oh, a little over a third have master's degrees. Uh, uh, we are an army laboratory, yeah, but our, our interest, you know, I've, uh, uh, they, we've had some very fascinating talks earlier from the national labs. Uh, you'll find this talk is going to be much more applied, is that we, we're interested in developing structural materials. There's a group of folks that are working on this project at, at uh, ERDIC, uh, with Engineer Research and Development Center. Uh, it's all of these folks. Uh, there are in this group uh, civil engineers and computer scientists and physicists and chemists and biologists and actually uh, at least one materials engineer. Uh, uh, if you take a look at the at the labs that I come from, is that we're predominantly a civil engineering lab, civil engineering environmental laboratory. The, pro pro the most represented profession is probably civil engineer, PhD civil engineer uh, professional. Uh, this group right here, we've assembled. We've had to assemble uh, over the last five years this diverse group to to take and do what we wanted to do. Uh, it required that. We also have lots of other collaborators. Uh, from NADIC, from NASA, uh, Rice University, uh, uh, ARL, and, uh, and I'd like to tell you who all of those are, but in the interest of time, I won't. Uh, this is, we entered this, uh, this technology about six years ago, and uh, what we were after is to try to change the paradigm develop the, the paradigm of material development. <clears throat> we had, for in fact, we had at one point a concrete laboratory who was busy producing better and better concrete. And what they did is they'd mix ingredients together and they would do an unconfined compressive test on the thing, and then uh, or they'd look at p-wave velocities or densities or whatever. Uh, but they had reached uh, the uh, 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 the point of diminishing returns in terms of an empirical approaches to materials. And so, uh, in fact, I think that a lot of people are doing this now, not just us, but we're working to change this overall material uh, development paradigm. Uh, and we're also after uh, a many-fold improvement in material properties, not a 10% improvement in strength to weight ratio, for example. Uh, and the approach, and uh, in fact, I think uh, Bobby Sundrick talked about it earlier, it's very similar, is that uh, we're using multi-scale atomistic predominantly at this point, but we're moving on to multi-scale simulations to guide material design and synthesis. Uh, we're using uh, some amazing uh, molecules that uh, uh, you've heard other speakers speak about, like carbon nanotubes or graphene or uh, silicon carbide uh, crystalline structures as strength members. Uh, we're also doing material response uh, at multiple scales, both at macro scale and also in working with other folks at the uh, at the nano scale. That's a v that's that's still developing. Uh, and we also are doing advanced material synthesis. And the overall mantra for this approach to material development is design first, then build, but do this at the molecular level. Well, uh, we had none of this technology, or very little of this technology, and so we decided that we would use this project to build it. Uh, and so we set ourselves a goal uh, to take and develop a carbon nanotube-based tensile material that would have a million PSI tensile strength. Okay, we, when we set this goal for ourselves, we thought this was going to be the strongest tensile material around. It turns out carbon fiber, of course, one brand, one manufacturer of carbon fiber actually manufactures a carbon fiber that has 7 gigapascal, 1 million PSI tensile strength. But we thought if we could do this in, uh, in over the course of four or five years, this would be a major accomplishment. If you take a look at the carbon fiber that does go to a million PSI, it was developed in the early 60s. Gra uh, 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 it, and it has largely not improved since that time. 
So if we could do this in five years, that's pretty cool. We would have twice the strength to weight ratio of Kevlar. We'd have five times the tensile strength of a very high strength steel, something like a 4340 steel, which has uh, 200 KSI, 200,000 PSI tensile capability. It would inaugurate this paradigm shift in material development for us and begin laying the technical foundation for rapid development of other super materials and materials by design. So people have talked a lot about nanotubes. Uh, they are, and graphene, are perhaps the strongest molecules ever discovered. They are. Uh, the tensile strength, depending on which corality you're talking about, uh, of about 15 and a half million PSI, or those who like English units, 110 gigapascals, which is about 150 times a high strength steel. High strength steel is 100,000 PSI steel. Uh, they have a density about a six to a third that of steel. Uh, they have a Young's modulus about five times that of steel and a strength to weight ratio about 450 to 900 times that of steel. But they have some problems in that uh, these ex properties exist only at the molecular scale. They'll suffer, they suffer brittle failure for the most part, and I'll show you that. Uh, they also have weak intermolecular bonds. And carbon nanotubes are expensive, although that's, that, that problem is falling away like very fast. These are some initial simulations we did. A dusty a major from our outfit did these using tight binding molecular dynamic simulations. If we were after a million PSI fiber, the first thing to check is, okay, how weak is the molecule trying to make up this fiber, especially since this molecule is going to have different molecular defects. And so we examined four, three different kinds of molecular defects, a stone wells defect, uh, we removed a couple of uh, carbon atoms and removed a couple of carbon atoms next to each other. And these are the stress strain curves we calculated using tight binding molecular dynamics. And uh, in general, the, the, a, a perfect 5-5 uh, five, five crowded carbon nanotube goes to about 15 and a half million PSI tensile strength. It suffers a brittle failure. Uh, if you add defects to this, then what you can get is up to about a 40% decrease in the peak uh, tensile stress and in the, in the critical strain. But you know, okay, so we're at 10 million PSI. We're trying to build a 1 million PSI fiber. This, this is not our problem. So uh, we were satisfied with this, and it, we published these results in 2006 and 2007. Uh, if you take a look at the ability to actually test uh, nano, uh, carbon nanotubes, individual nanotubes, and measure their response, uh, the data that existed in the literature at the time was all over the map. And then there was a very good paper. Uh, most of the, the best work was done at North. Western University, in my opinion, and they continued that. And in fact, in 2008, they published a paper uh, out of Horatio Espinosa's group uh, where they had actually pulled a multi walled carbon nanotube apart and uh, watched it under an SEM as they pulled it apart. And they, they uh, measured critical strains and stresses that were in agreement with this. And we were just tickled to death because we were, we were, we were hanging on a limb prior to that. We also made other discoveries uh, uh, about using the simulations. You know, one, this brittle failure that they suffer, we found a way around that. If you change the corality, you can actually get room temperature, uh, very tough molecules if you go to like a 10-5 corality carbon nanotube. Uh, we also developed methods to take and build uh, carbon nanotube, fibers of carbon nanotubes at the molecular level. This is uh, digital models. Uh, that, had, uh, w that had things like a, a, a Gaussian distribution of the carbon nanotubes making up the fiber. Uh, and one of the things, and a lot of people were trying to do this, were trying to take and build very strong fibers. In fact, there are still some that are trying this today by increasing the length of the carbon nanotubes and trying to depend on van der Waal forces to take and uh, uh, to be additive over a longer and longer engagement lengths until they could actually match the uh, uh, the the uh, strength of the carbon nanotubes. And in fact, I was encouraging our group to do this. Okay? We had one group, and I'll tell you about them in a minute, who were busy growing carbon nanotubes. I kept encouraging them to grow longer and longer. And we have a very good uh, uh, physicist at my place. His name is Charles Cornwell. And I kept uh, asking, okay, Charles, I'd like you to do some simulations to determine how long this overlap length has to be before we reach the strength of the carbon nanotube. And, uh, well, Charles is very good. This is the part of the curve I was envisioning, a linear relationship between contact length and the force between the molecules. It turns out that this thing reaches an asymptotic value. What's not obvious is that the nanotubes can strain along their length, and after a while you can pull a ring of carbon out of a bundle of carbon nanotubes, 
without ever displacing the far end. And it doesn't matter if the, at that point if the nanotube is three times as long or five times as long. You can't, it, 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 the nanotube, the fiber will ultimately will pull apart. So that was kind of dismal. But we came across uh, some experimentalists that had reported the creation of interstitial carbon atom bonds uh, by radiation. And actually what was happening here was that uh, some of the folks uh, uh, were they noticed in their SEMs that the properties of the nanotubes that they were imaging was changing. And uh, they looked back at things like increasing modulus and they deduced that they were giving an interstitial carbon atom bond. So we asked uh, uh, Dusty Major to take and do a simulation of this and uh, look at the force between these two molecules as you pulled one apart. Uh, that's his plot. And on the curve, the little light blue line that you can't see, well, that's all the calculations we had done up until that time. And so the, you know, this was orders of magnitude uh, greater uh, load sharing between those two molecules. This was followed uh, by Charles Cornwell producing an entire fiber uh, that had statistical distributions of carbon nanotube links and also densities of the uh, of the interstitial carbon atom bonds and looking how that molecule, uh, how that fiber now uh, held up its, its stress-strain relationships. These are the curves that were produced. This is published in a, a recent paper, May this year, uh, and it turns out that actually uh, if you do this with this interstitial carbon atom bond, you can take and create a, a fiber. If you hold your mouth just right, that'll go to about 60 gigapascals or about 8.6 million PSI. We think that this is probably the first to, uh, simulation to identify a scalable molecular design and predictive mechanical properties for a many million PSI fiber. So this approach about using the simulations to guide the material design was, was paying off for us. Uh, I mentioned to you I had another group that uh, Charlie Marsh, Dr. Charles Marsh is heading up at uh, the, the, this material synthesis. And they've been making lots of discoveries and I'm starting to run a little short. So uh, I won't go through all of these, but things that are very notable is one, they kept refining their ability to grow carbon nanotube forests and they got to where they were growing a uh, forest about three and a half millimeters long, which is not the world's record. Uh, I think the group up in the University of Cincinnati has that or had that, but it's probably a record within the DOD. Uh, they also discovered a whole new structural form of carbon nanotubes uh, that occurred in a May issue of, of uh, the, the journal Carbon, that, an article on that. And they also showed that you could build carbon nanotube networks by using SSDNA to pull the carbon nanotubes together. So they've been a very productive group. Well, right now that group is performing radio frequency plasma optimization experiments uh, up in Champaign, at a lab in Champaign. We're also doing experiments with the uh, Army Research Lab uh, in, uh, in Aberdeen, Dr. Daphne Pappas and Michelle Fleshman, uh, again trying to create, optimize the creation of these bonds. Uh, we have, uh, it, it turns out that two other groups are taking the same approach that we are. Uh, the very good group at Northwestern, they're using irradiation to try to create these interstitial carbon bonds. They may be using, I think they're using E-beam irradiation as opposed to plasma. Uh, and Professor Alan Wendell's group at Cambridge, he's doing the, he's do, using also E-beam irradiation to create these, these uh, interstitial carbon atom bonds. At the end of the day, is that uh, we and others are, are close to producing a lab demonstration of a scalable carbon nanotube fiber with a tensile strength of over a million PSI. Like I say, we meet our project experiments uh, goals if we get a million, but, um, but uh, like I say, the upper end on that is about 8.5 million. So that's okay. That was a good uh, learning exercise for us and it's, and it's still going on. But our, the, the material we're more excited about is, the, uh, is, a, is a ceramic composite. Ceramics are beautiful materials. They're the almost great material. Uh, if you take a look at something like a silicon carbide, it has a Young's modulus that's about twice that of steel. It's got a compressive strength that's about three times that of this very high strength steel. Uh, it's got a density that's more similar to that of aluminum than steel, about one third that of steel. So this is great material, but the reason we don't use it is because it's got a little problem with fracture toughness and tensile strength, is measure, bending strength is a measure of that. Uh, it turns out that if you compare that to something like aluminum, for example, it's about one-fifth of the fracture toughness of aluminum. 
the bending strength is about 70 ksi compared to almost 600 ksi for its compressive strength. This imbalance uh, uh, makes it so it's not as it, you can't use it in place of steel. Well, uh, ceramics have been uh, highly uh, they're highly uh, have very high compressive strengths and modulus, highly corrosive resistant, operate at very high temperatures. Uh, silicon carbide is not new; it's been mass produced since 19, 1893. Uh, something like silicon carbide. Now, I'll concentrate on silicon carbide, but actually, born carbide is, a, is another uh, potential ceramic that's also very good. Uh, silicon carbide is made of abundant, abundant materials, just silicon and carbon. And we got lots of both of those. So, we, we set this new goal for us is that uh, th this problem with ceramics is exactly the same problem that exists with concrete. And we use concrete for all kinds of things. Concrete has a relatively high compressive strength, a very small tensile strength, negligible fracture toughness. And what we do is we put steel in it or we put fiber in it, and people have been doing this forever. Well, not forever, but for a long time. Well, we said, well, okay, what if we were to take something like a silicon carbide matrix as a compressive member and use uh, carbon nanotubes, graphene for tensile strengthening and fracture toughness. This design is at the molecular level similar to what you see with steel reinforced concrete. When we looked over the literature, we did find some, some promising results. They were getting 25 to 75% improvement in ceramic toughness via, uh, by the inclusion of, of carbon nanotubes. And there are some references for you. Well, so these are our performance goals for this ceramic composite is that we want a uh, composite that has about the same density of, of aluminum, uh, Young's modulus at least that of steel, uh, compressive strength of at least 300 KSI, but a tensile strength also of about 300 KSI, and minimum fracture toughness of about 25 megapascals per meter to the one half, which is the same as aluminum. Well, this represents a five-fold improvement in the strength and toughness of something like a silicon carbide. Uh, nobody's been able to do anything. I mean, people have been interested in doing this for a long time, and they were looking for 10 and 15 and percent kind of improvements. We're looking for 500 percent improvements. Uh, if you do, if you meet these performance goals, then what happens, you end up with a, a composite uh, that has three times the stiffness to weight ratio of aluminum or steel, four times the strength to weight ratio of high strength aluminum, an aircraft aluminum, aluminum like a 70-75 T6, and nine times the strength to weight ratio of a high strength steel, high uh, 100 KSI steel. If we made this out of silicon carbide and graphene and carbon nanotubes, it would be made of abundant materials, carbon and silicon. Uh, and it turns out that most of the design, structural design, is predicated on either a deflection criteria, you don't want the bridge to bend down too much, or a load criteria, you don't want it to break either. Well, under either of those two constraints, given these, given these parameters, it turns out that you could take this this super ceramic and replace aluminum and steel at one third or less the weight. That's kind of a broad brush thing. And I ought to add, though, is that we've checked. It's the, this is not known to be impossible, but considered very challenging goals. Uh, one senior re ceramic researcher said he couldn't figure. He said, "I don't know that it's impossible." He said, and uh, he says, "But it's not going to happen in my lifetime." So. It was interesting, I had a couple of young physicists in part of that team that I just showed you. Simultaneously, when I told them that, they both got up from the table and asked how old the guy was. <laughs> uh, well, but the, but the ramifications of that are enormous, is that uh, uh, if you take and look at a uh, rapidly implaceable bridge system, uh, this currently weighs about 10,600 pounds. It would be cut down to about 3,500 pounds. But the reason it weighs as much as it does, because it has to carry this truck, which is also aluminum and steel, it weighs 58 to 98,000 pounds. Well, you break it down by two-thirds, too, excluding the load that it carries. So weight savings leads to weight savings. This, if we're able to do, in fact, I told the team, is that, you know, guys, if you, if you do this, there's your grandchildren going to talk about you. And if you take a look at the ramifications to the transportation industry, ships, planes, beyond the Army, it, this has got enormous ramifications. But also, I can say, is that the people would say it's very difficult. Uh, these are some initial simulations. These simulations are much more complex than what we were doing before. Bryce Devine uh, did these. Uh, this is a tensile failure of a polycrystalline silicon carbide, nanocrystalline uh, silicon carbide. One of the things that's interesting, and these are, again, very preliminary, is that he, he's capturing uh, intergranular failure. And one of the things that surprised us, we began testing some advanced armor, and that's what we saw is intergranular failure. We hadn't expected that. We expected the failure to occur along the, the boundaries. 
Okay, so that's continuing, and, uh, but I wanted to give you a, a sense of what the national global trends in material development are. We did, uh, this is back to carbon nanotube fibers, we did some key searches on just carbon nanotubes, uh, keyword searches. Uh, this was about three months ago. This was repeated about three months ago, and we came up with, uh, using Engineer Village 2, we came up with about uh, this number of articles. These are the two top countries that were represented, the U.S. and China. 59% of these articles were since 2007. If we did a keyword search on molecular dynamics, we got many more hits, about 120,000. Japan and the U.S. were the, the major performers. 56 of these were since 2004. If we did, if we combined carbon nanotubes and molecular dynamics, these folks are using molecular dynamics probably to guide uh, carbon nanotube material design. We end up with much fewer articles, about 2,400 articles. The U.S. had most of these, and China was the second. 55% of these were published since 2007. So the sense I want to give you is that uh, other worldwide, this whole business is going on about using molecular dynamics to start guiding material design. Most of these uh, research appear to be occurring over the last four years. I heard mention earlier about the advanced uh, material, uh, the president's advanced, manu uh, advanced you know, material genome initiative. This was uh, from the White House June 24 this year. And the, the essence of this is it's a $100 million program uh, that's called the Materials Genome Initiative. It's in the President's FY12 budget request. Uh, and this funding would go to the DOE, the DOD, the NSF, and the National Institute of Standards. And it would fund computational tools, software, uh, methods for material characterization and development open standards and databases. But the overall sense, if you read this document, is that it's ab about causing this paradigm shift that, that we've been after for some time. Uh, the lengthy time frame for material, this is from the article, uh, and it basically says is that much of the, the, uh, the lengthy time it takes, they, they're trying to speed up material development. Much of the time is spent uh, today, people doing experiments as opposed to doing simulations to guide the material design. And I guess I think this is true, is that this, uh, what we produce so far is kind of an early example that this process will work for very simple material so far. I uh, also heard tell today about the, uh, the exascale, DARPA's exascale uh, program. Okay, uh, and uh, its goal, of course, is to increase computing by a thousand fold across multiple computing uh, platforms, not just at the top end. Well, what that means is that if they're successful is that a few users will have access to an exaflop machine, a thousand petaflop machine. Uh, we probably won't. Uh, other users are still expected to get a thousand-fold improvement in their comparable machines. Uh, the, the, we, in fact, much of this is done under a challenge project uh, uh, that's uh, funded out of the HPC Modernization Office. All our, our computer time is. Well, we use the uh, the supercomputing center at Erdic in Vicksburg. It's a nice center. It's got about 438 teraflops capability between three systems: uh, Cray XT6, which is labeled number. 51 in the top 500, uh, an SGI Altex ICE machine that's number 48 in the top 500. This is actually 49, that's a mistake. And Cray X, this is as of June 2011. And so, and a, and a Cray XT4, which is number 200 out of the top 500. So this is, these are nice equipment that we have access to. If you take a look at our typical large dynamic simulations, we in general use about 2,000 processors and we have a four day compute. Uh, that's 0.2 million CPU hours on our, 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 large, our larger scale simulations. And so to gauge this impact on, on our work is that we'll just assume a thousand fold improvement and see what it does for us. These are some simulations that were done by uh, Bryce Devine. Uh, this is, centering is very important for polycrystalline manufacture. That's how you manufacture polycrystalline materials. The, uh, uh, so we've got a program starting to take and start modeling the centering, centering process. <clears throat> well, the largest centering, centering simulations are about, uh, for us are about 20 million atoms. Uh, it takes about four days on the computer if we get steady time to turn this thing around. Uh, and that's again about 0.2 million CPU hours. These simulations are limited to 20 nanometer crystalline structures. Uh, and only go to about a nanosecond at a time. If you look at these curves over here, these are three different, the outputs of three of those simulations, and it shows densification of a, of a ceramic sample under centering. Uh, 
And uh, you'll notice this five, milli five nanometer crystalline structure uh, densifies fairly quickly. The 10 is slower yet, and we can't get the 15 nanometer uh, structure to actually even show any difference over the time scale that we ran this problem, which is about 400 picoseconds. So uh, we need the longer times uh, to take and capture the larger, larger uh, crystalline structures. We're trying to optimize how we go about centering larger crystalline structures. Uh, exocell computing would allow us to do 20 nanometer crystalline structures for about one microsecond. So considerably longer, about a factor of 20, I uh, know. Uh, it's actually about a factor of a thousand beyond it, uh, out to a microsecond's a thousand, a thousand times this. And the exoscale computing would also allow us to simulate up to 100 nanometer sized uh, uh, crystalline structures, they're centering uh, in about 200 nanosecond uh, in time, so it extend our parameter space uh, to look for additional effects. We're also, of course, continuing our work trying to optimize the design of the, uh, of the, of the, of the ceramic composite. So in just trying to, to analyze the uh, just, just poly nanocrystalline silicon carbides, right now, uh, from 2D MD molecular dynamic simulations, we're revealing an effect uh, on the uh, fracture uh, phenomena that's occurring above 50 nanometers crystalline size. We can do that in 2D, but we ought to be doing it in 3D. Uh, but 3D model, the best we can do is uh, up to about a 20 nanometer crystalline structure. Uh, that's about, a, again, a four-day compute and a 0.2 million CPU hour computation. Uh, we can't do at, uh, above. Uh, we can't do above 50 nanometers, where we think something is happening based on the 2D simulations. Uh, exascale computing would take one of our four-day, our 3D four-day computations, and turn it into a six-minute computation. Uh, this makes it so that we can now iterate very quickly in the parameter space to take and look at things like uh, crystalline size and orientation uh, on uh, toughness and strengthening. It doesn't include our carbon nanotubes yet or our graphene structures as strengthening members. Uh, exoscale uh, computing would also allow us to take and uh, model up to 200 nanometer crystalline, uh, crystalline structures. These are 32 crystalline structures in a box. Uh, and the other thing, exoscale computing would allow us to reduce the strain rates by a thousand. And that makes it so that it looks more like experiments. So these are the effects we're think we think that are going to happen because of exoscale computing. Is that one, uh, it increases the size and computational complexity of the material models and it results in more realistic based simulations. It also accelerates the trend from molecular dynamic simulations and material experiments to operate at common length and time scales. This has been a big problem uh, in this technology for quite a while, allowing for greater verification and feedback between simulations and experiments. X-scale computing uh, also will uh, allow uh, simulations to provide uh, uh, better understanding of material response uh, when where experiments are impossible or 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 too costly, uh, it also accelerates this overall trend for using. Oh, I'm, my time is over. Let me jump to the last. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, my time is not over. I'm going to continue. <laughs> uh, so, exascale computing will also accelerate material. I think the bottom line is it's going to accelerate material development a lot. So this is my summary. Uh, uh, these technologies are aligning to cause the material development paradigm to change. It's changing. Uh, we're making progress, along with others, towards this multi-million PSI CNT fiber uh, using these technologies. Uh, we're also work using these same technologies to develop a super ceramic to replace aluminum and steel with two-thirds weight reduction. Uh, the international community is adopting similar strategies towards material development. Most of this work occurred in the last four years. And the president's uh, recent material genome initiative strongly supports the acceleration of material development by the use of simulations. DARPA's exascale Excel computing program will further enable simulation-based material development. And I, one of the things is uh, when we started this program, uh, we used to have revolutionary improvements in materials on the horizon. It's not true anymore. They're happening. And I've got one more slide since I've got a little time, and I wanted to, uh, this is beyond just material development. Uh, 
We've been in this stuff for about five years. And of course, you know, I'm from an, an engineering laboratory. My background is physics and engineering mechanics, but I'm in, from an engineering laboratory. My focus is on engineering. If you take a look, uh, what we've found is that, uh, that many, if not most, of the things that engineers really care about are strongly influenced by phenomena at the nanoscale. And this was an eye opener. And if you take some of the examples, are of course material strengths and stiffnesses, but also friction, combustion, uh, detonation, uh, macro material synthesis. We're using these, as I mentioned, to actually guide synthesis too. Chemical properties, heat transmission, lubricants, photovoltaics, ice formation and adherence, corrosion, weathering, aging, fluid structure interactions. There's a lot of interesting work to be done there. Uh, and in fact, at the end of the day, life. So we think that this uh, nanotechnology and working at the nanoscale uh, it's, is the big frontier for engineering technology advancement over the next several decades. And a huge part of that is our ability to take and do simulations of materials across multiple scales. That's my story.